Amen. Good morning. Merry Christmas. Is it weird that Christmas is a week away? It's like, how did this year just went by like so fast? Um, I got a question for you. You guys ready? It's a hard one. Who are you? Good, I like that. Um, how many of you are just going to say your name? <laughs> I'm Luke Dunn, that's who I am. You know, your name doesn't say much about who you are. Um, you think about that. If you just said, somebody said, who are you, and you just said your name, they would have almost no clue of, of anything about you, except for maybe, possibly, where you come from. Um, you know, some names are pretty obvious, like you come from Germany or you come from France or something, I don't know. Um, but for the most part, that's not going to tell you a ton. Um, now, yeah, I, <laughs> I want, I'm going to share with you just a little bit of a secret. It's not really a secret, but um, not many people know this. I joined a bowling league this uh, fall. And why are you laughing? So... <laughs> So, um, it's fun, but, you know, I joined it, like, there's nobody on my team that I knew, nobody, uh, hardly anybody even in the whole league that I knew uh, or know, uh, and so I'm getting to know a lot of different people. You play a different team every week, and so you're getting to know a lot of different people, and so I, you know, the obvious things come up every, every time you play with somebody new, which is, you know, who are you? And you're trying to, like, get to know people, and, you know, you, they know your name. Your name's listed on the board. But then beyond that, the obvious things that begin to be the questions, right, is um, where are you from? So, uh, are you, you know, like, my name, my last name is Dunn. There's a bunch of Dunns around here. So, are you related to the Dunns in the area? And uh, no, I'm not. So, that brings up another question. Well, how did you, how did you get to be here? I'm a transplant, and so why are you a transplant? Well, it's because I'm a pastor, and so that brings up a whole lot of other questions or stops a lot of questions. <laughs> Usually it's like, oh, okay, and uh, um, then it gets awkward. But so, you know, then the questions is, for me, you're like, well, how did, why did you want to be a pastor? And you know the answer to that is I didn't. <laughs> And, uh, or what made you decide to become a pastor? And, it, and I, you know, the issue is it wasn't really my choice. And, you know, some of these things, well, that gets into a whole other conversation about my understanding, my theology, about calling and all the rest of it. And so, you know, that, that's kind of stuff that can go deep, but a lot of people don't always want to go that deep. What is the noise? Is it the fan? Turn the fans off, please. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, is somebody's cell phone going off? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. So we're all distracted, not just me. All right. So, <laughs> thank you, Austin. I was like, I was like, John Kelly, turn your phone off. What are you doing? <laughs> somebody's playing a game. I don't know. Um, so the the question about who you are, like, what your job is, does that really define who you are? I mean, to a degree, I mean, it kind of spurs on some other questions about why you do what you do. Do you like what you do? Does that really define you? Um, but then, you know, do you have a wife? Do you have a husband? Do you have kids? Do you have family? What kind of a family did you come from? Are you, or do you have siblings? How many siblings do you have? What order are you in? Um, you know, all those things. Where did you grow up? Did you grow up in the same place that you live in now? Or did you grow up somewhere else? Have you traveled a lot? Have you, you know, all these different things kind of help try to define a little bit of your identity, but they don't really exactly get to it. So then you go into some things we don't ever talk about, like, you know, what is your personality type? What, what is your temperament? Are you easily angered? Do you, what, what, anno well, we do talk about this, what annoys you? People pretty much figure that out, <laughs> you know, as they get to know you, but these things kind of take time and then here's, here's another issue, though, is 
do you know these things about yourself? Do you understand some things about yourself? When you're talking about, you know, your preferences, your hobbies, the things that you like, you know, where you grew up, your family of origin, all those different things, and then you're talking about, like, your, your preferences in terms of your beliefs. Who, we said, you know, started off, who am I? And the issue is, well, I'm a child of God. And I start to see myself very specifically in the lens or through the lens of what the Bible tells me about who I am, right? It's more than just what I think about myself. There's more to it than that. Did we not turn the fans off? <laughs> Somebody who knows how to turn the fans off, please turn the fans off. <laughs> I was like, I was waiting for that noise to go away. Um, so here's the deal. You ready? Okay, we we're waiting for the fans to turn off. But <laughs> The deal is this. We live in a culture right now. Okay, this is not a secret. We live in a culture right now where identity is the, the focal point. And it is something that our enemy, Satan, has been using to try to distract and to harm and to destroy a whole generation, okay? This, this focus of, of identity and worth and value and am I really who I think I am? Am I who other people think I am? Can I be something different than what I was? And I believe that our enemy has taken this issue of identity and he's really thrown a wrench into a lot of people's thinking about who they are. And they don't know who they are because the, the world doesn't really give them a good answer and they don't have a biblical understanding of who they should be according to what God's Word says. And here's the, the issues. Jesus knows who he is. He knew who he was. And his clarity on that issue, I think, was the strength given by God through the power of the Holy Spirit, his identity as being God in the flesh, but his focus on knowing his value, knowing his worth, knowing who he was and who he was going to be and who he would always be. Those things kept him clearly on the path to his purpose. And because a lot of people don't know who they are, they're not really clear about um, their identity, and they're trying to figure it out, and they're wondering, and they don't have a clear understanding biblically, and they're looking to the world to tell them who they are, some things begin to happen, which is that they, they look to other people to clarify or to give them an identity. And this is why I think, for a lot of people, um, there is a... Um, I don't know if you've noticed this, there's a huge social anxiety that is almost like an epidemic. Have you seen this? Like, it, especially in our younger people, but it, it, it can be many, many other people. But there's this idea, this, like, we're so scared to, I mean, just, the, just being up front in front of people, like what I'm doing right now and, and talking to people would terrify a lot of people. Um, because, it, because of one reason in particular, which is that the value that people think of themselves is gained from how other people think of them. And if you don't like me or you don't like what I'm saying or you think I'm being silly or you think I'm stupid or you don't agree with me, then that destroys my self-confidence. And if that's your focus, then you'll never be comfortable in situations where people are um, not in agreement with you, don't like you, don't, don't think that you're spectacular. That's why it's important to have a clear biblical understanding of who we are. Because then it gives you the freedom to really be your true self, according to what God has said, okay? All right, let's get into our passage. This is Luke chapter... Uh, one, I'm picking it up in verse 26, and this is uh, Gabriel talking to Mary about who the Savior is going to be. Let's stand as we read God's Word this morning. Luke 1, 
beginning in verse 26. It says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. He came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom. There will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angels answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. And Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your son. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that gives us understanding, conviction, power, strength, ability, new life, um, hope. (laughs) We thank you for doing all of it for us on the cross, being willing to come and uh, sacrifice your life, to put yourself in the most vulnerable position in existence, to be born a baby into this world, to live a life, a human life, full of all the challenges and complexities that we all walk through, the frustrations, the temptations, um, experiencing everything that we experience so that you could be a faithful high priest, knowing exactly what it is that we deal with that you might be even more gracious and merciful than you already are. And and Lord, we thank you for all of that and giving it up on the cross that uh, we might have a new life. And what an amazing thing the gospel is. We celebrate Christmas. We celebrate salvation. We celebrate all that you've done. Um, And Lord, help us to grab a hold of it Truly, with faith, for your glory, for our sake, in Jesus' name, amen. So, as we look at that story, it's uh, oftentimes um, part of the Advent, part of the, you know, the, the, the stories that we always look at at Christmas time. And we focus in on, usually, the conversation between Gabriel and Mary because that it is a conversation between Gabriel and Mary and, and what her response is, because that is an important thing. Her response to Gabriel is kind of everything that's going to uh, be the tipping point for us in our faith, because we need her to say yes, right? So we look at Mary and we say, okay, what, what about Mary? It doesn't say a lot about Mary. We just have to know a few things about her identity, um, which is that she has to be, according to Scripture, she has to be of the tribe of Judah. Okay, the, the, the Savior is going to come from the tribe of Judah. We, we know that. She is of the tribe of Judah. She has to be of the line of David, and she is of the line of David. So the Savior has to be in a particular uh, genealogy, and she fits the bill for that. But there are some other things in her character that are also required for Jesus to grow up in this household, okay? And so she must be not only Jewish, but she has to be a devoted believer, actual, bona fide, authentic, uh, walking with the Lord, loves Jesus or loves, loves God and, and wants to obey Him. And so she has this humble heart. She wants to obey the Lord. She wants to do what He says. And so that characteristic, the, the, the sense of um, her awe and wonder at God and her willingness to do whatever he wants, no matter how hard it might be for her, challenging it might be in her life, because being found pregnant when you are only just engaged is a pretty big deal at that time in that culture, in her, in her life. It could mean um, ostr- being ostracized. It could mean 
a death penalty. It could mean all kinds of stuff. I mean, it was a big deal for them, uh, for her to be found pregnant when she was not, she was only engaged and not married yet. So for her to say, well, I'm the Lord's servant, I'll just do whatever, that, that was a, a pretty big deal for Jesus to grow up in a household where both of his earthly parents were going to follow the Lord and show him what it meant to be a servant because he is going to be the servant of humanity. So that's a, a big deal, and that's what we have with Mary. But the, the conversation between Gabriel and Mary is really not so much about Mary, okay? It's she's found favor, and she's going to be the, the mother of the Savior. But everything that Gabriel says really is about Jesus, okay? And so that's why we're here is because we're, we want to see what he says about Jesus that I believe Jesus takes hold of and he focuses on because he has to know who he is. He has to know it um, and he has to focus on it and he has to pay attention to it. And every step of the way, I, I don't think there was ever a moment that Jesus didn't know, believe, understand, focus on, and, and really make sure that it was in his mind who he was because that's going to determine his value his worth. He, not, he must know how valuable he is. And so what does Gabriel say about him? He says, uh, you're going to bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus. The name Jesus means God saves, literally means God saves. Uh, it also refers back to an Old Testament name, which is Joshua. Um, in in uh, Hebrew, you would say Yeshua. Uh, but Joshua was the one who led the uh, Israelites into the promised land. And so Jesus actually, he shares that name for a reason because that was, that was a purpose of God to draw his people into the promised land and deliver them into the, what was on, uh, in their minds, like heaven on earth. Jesus is going to fulfill that eternally, spiritually for everyone who will believe in him, that he will lead anyone who will trust him into the promised land, heaven. That he had that in his mind all the time. His name is Jesus. He knew that he was the Savior. He, he never forgot that, and he never stopped paying attention to the reality that he had to live a particular life in order to save all those that would believe in him. He knew that. He understood that, and, and he never stopped believing and understanding that. So he knows that his name is Jesus. He knows that he will be the Savior of the world, and it says that he will be the Son of the Most High. So he knows who his real Father is. He is the eternal Son. When you look at Scripture, you see that God is mentioned as three in one all through from Genesis all the way to Revelation, that Jesus is eternally existent. So he finds himself on the planet as a human being, knowing that he is eternal in his nature, that he has always been the Son. He's been the Son from the time that, that there was a God, there was the Son. He was always the Son. So he knows that he is eternally the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, that he is God in the flesh, and he focuses on that, that he is God on earth. And it says that the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. He's going to inherit the eternal rule of not only Israel, but of the whole world. It says that there will be no end uh, to his reign. He will reign for over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. Meaning two things. One is the scope of his rule is going to be uh, everything. He's going to rule the whole world, every nation, every language, every people. Philippians says it this way. He says that uh, at the name of Jesus, every uh, knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Right? We, we've heard this. Philippians chapter 2 tells us about the, the, the humility of Christ, but also the glory of Christ. That every single person is going to acknowledge one day that Jesus is Lord and Savior. Now, those who trust him ahead of time, before they die or before he returns, get to acknowledge that with great joy in their hearts. Amen? You and I, who believe in Jesus, when Jesus returns or that we go before him in, in death, either one, 
Okay, at that point, we're going to acknowledge Jesus as Lord and we're going to be praising God that he sent his Savior and that we've trusted him, that we have eternal life in his name, that we get to walk straight into heaven without passing go. It's going to be an awesome thing. But the rest of the world who refuses to acknowledge Jesus as Lord, they will still acknowledge that he's Lord, but with terror, with regret, or with disdain. They can't not acknowledge that he is the king of the universe because he is the actual owner, the rightful owner of everything that exists because he's the creator. The Bible says that Jesus created everything that exists, that God through Jesus created everything that exists in the world. He's the rightful owner of everything. So everyone, everything in the world, even those things that don't acknowledge him now, will acknowledge him then because they can't deny it. They're going to be right face to face with him. It just isn't going to be a pleasant event. So he keeps this in mind. He's going to rule the scope of everything. And it says there will be no end, meaning also no end in time. He's already been the ruler in eternity past. He's going to be the ruler for eternity future. There'll be no conclusion to his rule. It's just going to be forever and ever over everything. This is something that he clearly understands. He knows. He believes. He, he understands that he is the eternal rightful ruler of the universe for all time. Can you imagine like walking through the, the world knowing that? Just that he, every place where he steps, he made it. And he's going to rule it. And he's going to restore it. And he's going to have charge over it. And, and it's never going to stop. And it's just going to be... But for the moment that he's finding himself on the planet, he's rejected. He's dismissed. He's argued with. He's denied. He's mocked. He's ridiculed. He's hated. I, I, it's hard for me to sometimes uh, understand. You know, sometimes... You ever feel like people don't like you? I mean, just me? Okay. You know, you're like, I get it. I, I mean, I really do. I get why, you know, some people might not like me because sometimes you kind of get almost a perspective of yourself from the outside and you're like, if I weren't me, I don't know. Would I like me? <laughs> Anybody else ever feel that way? But I'm not that good. So it doesn't, it's not like a big mystery. But you have God who is holy and good and kind and gracious and, and glorious and loving and generous and every good thing that you can think of, okay, you attribute that to God. This is God's nature, his character. God is all of those things, and, and infinitely more than that. And still, people don't like him. In fact, much of the world hates him. And then another part of the world rejects him, even, even though there's this kind of a question, does he exist, does he not exist? And, and so, yeah, I'm just going to say, I don't care, and I'm, not, I'm just going to reject him. And you just think, here's Jesus. He's walking the earth. He's ministering. He's he is healing, he is preaching, every, everything is declaring that he is this, the Savior, he's the Messiah. And still people are, are rejecting him and hating him. And his response is graciousness. I mean, sometimes he, he kind of lays the law down a little bit. I mean, he, he read Matthew 23, okay? He does kind of yell at the Pharisees for a little bit and tell them they're a brood of vipers and they're, you know, they're a bunch of uh, tombs with bones inside and they're, you know, all that kinds of stuff. But for the most part, I mean, he's, he's just patient. Even with them, he's, that's still very patient. I mean, he could call down 10,000 angels and just destroy everything and he, he just walks away. But you have this, this picture of Jesus who doesn't feel the need to get even with them. Even on the cross, they're killing him. And he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It, where, he, where you and I would feel so much rage at being rejected like that. Like, how, 
How dare you do that? But he, because he knows who he is. He knows his value. He understands that he doesn't have to get glory from people in order to be glorious. You understand that, that, that difference? And here's what I'm saying is when you know who you are, you don't have to worry about what people think. When you, when you have that locked down, you understand who you are. You don't have to try to get people's approval. And he didn't. He didn't do that. But here's where we are. We have as much biblical revelation, prophecy, um, teaching, theology, etc., to tell us who we are as Jesus did. And to tell us how valuable we are and how worthy we are or how much worth we have, how, how much God loves us. The, the reality of what Scripture tells us about being a human being, no matter how talented you may be or how untalented you, you may think that you are, how attractive you are or how unattractive you think you are, how successful you are or how unsuccessful you might think you are, whatever the case may be, okay? Scripture says, as a human being, God made you in his image and he cares for you so much that he actually gave the dominion of the earth to you to take care of. He says that you're so valuable that he's willing to pay the highest price to secure a relationship with you. He will give his own son to die in your place in order for you just to know him, just to even have the chance to know him. That many people in the world are going to hear the gospel and they're going to reject it. He says, even just for the possibility that whosoever believes, I mean, that little section in John 3, 16, just, just whosoever believes. No one has greater love than this, that he laid down his life for his, what? His friends. And he, and he calls you a friend. He says, every human being, even if they hate me, even if they're my enemy, even as lost as they may be, even as unbelieving as they may be, he still values you and me to the nth degree, meaning infinitely. I mean, there's, you cannot place a higher value on what Jesus did for you because he is perfect and he's God and he's willing to give up that life on the cross in order to pay for whatever sin that you've committed, to wash it, to cleanse it, to get rid of it, to, in order to restore you into a right relationship with himself. So he, sa so he says, this is who you are. This is what the Bible declares to you and me. He says, this is who you are. You are a person that I've made in my image that I love and care for and I'm willing to die for. And so your value is basically infinite. So you take that, regardless of what you've done, regardless of what relationship you're in or relationship that you wish you were in, regardless of how many kids you have or how many dollar signs or how many zeros you have in the bank or don't have in the bank, whatever house that you have, whatever you know, degrees that you have or don't have, none of that contributes to your value in terms of how God sees you. He doesn't look at you and say, well, if you're just a little bit more successful, then I would like you more. If you just would lose a few pounds, then I would like you more. But we do that with each other. We do that to ourselves, right? Man, if I just could succeed in this way, if I could just get this, if I could just be this, if I, then I would be worthy of people's approval or whatever. And we beat ourselves up trying to get to a place where we feel valuable. And this is the whole issue of identity is that there are a whole generation, I think, of, of young people who are looking for some sense of value within themselves that they might get from peers, culture, I don't know, somebody outside. That if I could just be a certain way, then I would be valued, approved, worthy, something. Something. And it doesn't ever pan out. So that, that's why it keeps changing and it keeps being something else. 
It keeps shifting away from them to the point where they can never quite grasp it. Because this is the nature of the world versus the nature of spiritual things. The nature of the world is it's always changing. It's never solid. It isn't truth. The nature of spiritual things is it never changes. It never alters. You can always depend on it and trust it. And this is what God has said. This is the truth as, as God revealed it. And then he shares it with anyone who would hear it. And so if you understand your value, then you can have what we call self-respect. And self-respect says, I don't have to do what other people want me to do in order to gain their favor. I can do what is right because I'm trying to please my God. So here's the second thing, is that Jesus understood who he was, and he also understood whose he was. Okay? He, he knew he was a son. He knew he was the son of God, and he knew he was going to be the son of Mary. So he calls himself um, all through, especially the, uh, the book of Matthew, he calls himself the son of man. The son of man is his primary title he loves to use for himself. Why does he use that title? Because it kept him in mind of whose he was. That son of man in the book of Ezekiel was the title that God gave to Ezekiel to help him to understand that he was mortal, that he was a human being. The son of man in the book of Daniel was a revelation to show Daniel that the son of man was the Messiah. He was, he was called the son of man, but he was the son of God. He was eternal. Jesus keeps that title in his view because he had a, it gives him a clear picture of whose he was, who he belonged to, and what his responsibility was. When he went to uh, the, the Last Supper with his disciples in the book of John, it says that he washed their feet and he says this, he says, I did not come to be served, right, but to serve. Because he knew who he was and he knew whose he was, and he had no doubt where he was going to go. He's going to rule forever. But in the meantime, whose he was, he belonged to his father. He was going to do exactly what his father wanted. And so all through the book of John, it says this, that he never did anything except what his father told him to do. He never said anything except what he heard his father saying and what he, he was told to say. Everything he did was an act of absolute 100% obedience at every moment. He always was completely obedient. This is the nature of a son. Whose you are, I belong to my father. That means this, the fifth commandment. Children, obey your parents. He was going to be completely obedient. So, question is, whose are you? Right? Hey, who you are, you're made by God, but you are fallen. You need, you need restoration. You need forgiveness. You need mercy and grace, and, and you need to be restored by the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus Christ. But whose are you? This is the identity that we have in Christ. The Bible says that once you put your life in his hands, he says that now you become his, we hate this term, his slave. The, the Christians originally were not called Christians. The, the term that was used most frequently in Scripture to, to define a believer in the first century in the New Testament was bondservant. I'm a servant of the Lord. I, I'm a servant of Christ. I'm a bondservant. I belong to Him. I am His. I, 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 I'm no longer my own. I don't belong to myself anymore. I belong to Him. I am... I'm now a servant of Christ. So whose I am puts the boundaries around what I'm supposed to be doing. But I don't have to be afraid because he's gracious and loving and has a good plan for me. Amen? So here's the deal. You know who you are. You know whose you are. How does that change what you do? I uh, have a lot of different titles 
We all do. You know, I'm a son. I'm a dad. I'm a husband. I'm a pastor. Um, I'm a Christian. All those things kind of try to help me to define who I am and whose I am. Um, when you think about just the issue of, of your titles, who, who, who are you, whose are you, what order do you put those things in? What are you first? I belong to him. First and foremost, whose I am, I belong to him, which means that he tells me what I am worth. He tells me what my life is supposed to be, what I'm supposed to be doing, how I'm supposed to live it. And what happens is I have value in that, but I also have purpose in that, and I have peace in that. I'm going to tell you one thing real quick, and then I'm done. The big problem with our world is that people think that they exist in order to be happy. Look around. What is the meaning of life? Everybody wants to be happy. And everybody is racing after something to make them happy. And they're missing the very thing that will actually bring them joy, which is giving their life to God, who doesn't promise you happiness. He promises you eternal life. The residual, the the result of giving your life to the Lord is that because of contentment, because of the peace that I have in my relationship with him and my confidence that I'm going to heaven one day and I know who I am and I know where, where I'm going to go and what I'm, what's going to happen in my life, what that means is that happiness is a result. I don't chase happiness. It, it follows me. And the world... He's got it backwards. And a lot of Christians are getting it backwards too. We're chasing happiness thinking that God will, I'll just kind of bring God along in my pursuit of things and money and position and titles and whatever, you know, hobbies that I think will make me happy or whatever relationship I need. To. Here's what's really great is that no matter your relationship in life, no matter whether you're a father, a mother, a husband, a wife, a, a brother, a sister, uh, an employee, an employer, a, a college graduate, college dropout, high school dropout, whatever status that you have in this world, any person who gives their life to the Lord can serve the Lord in whatever capacity that they are in. Did you get that? It doesn't matter if you're a student, you're a teacher, it doesn't matter if you're single, with your, or if you're married, you got a bunch of kids, you got no kids at home, whatever grandparent, widow, widower, whatever station you are in life, God can use it for his glory and for your good. You know your value. You know whose you are. You have as much potential to glorify God in your place as anyone does. Amen? Father, we love you. We thank you for showing us the way through Christ, for giving us an invitation to be part of it. Um, Lord, would you help us by the power of your spirit to receive that, hear that, own it, trust it. Um, Lord, the gospel is such a powerful thing. Lord, we... We can never do justice in trying to declare it. I, I only always think, you know, the foolishness of preaching, somehow even man's wisdom is, is foolishness, Lord, but your so-called foolishness is greater than all of man's wisdom. So, Lord, by your Spirit, would you take um, the Word of God, would you take your word, plant it deep in our hearts. Would you change minds? Would you restore souls? Would you call people to yourself? Would you um, convince people of their value? Would you show them 
that they belong to you. And that's a good thing. Lord, would you help us to let go of trying to control? Would you help us to let go of trying to be liked? And just lay it all down before you and let you be king, ruler, and savior of all of it. And we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to just invite you. I always want to invite you to respond to the Lord. Not, not to me. Respond to the Lord, the Holy Spirit, if he's leading you to lay your life down once and for all. Then this is the moment. This is the time to do it. And I always say, well, yeah, you can do it later. You can do it where you're at. You can go. And you and the Lord need to do that work. Nobody can do it for you. But the only moment that you have is this moment. So if he's impressing himself on your heart, then it is time to do it. Amen?